Welcome to the Global Marketing Show, the podcast for all things international business. I'm your host, Wendy Pease, president of Rapport International and a translation expert. Come along with me today as we talk to an expert in the global marketing world about facing their biggest fears, hearing about mistakes they made or saw, discussing best practices, and sharing fun travel language and culture stories. Welcome, my friends, to another episode of the Global Marketing Show. We're talking law today, legal law IP, so it's going to be lots of fun. Before we get into that, though, I want to remind you that we're sponsored by Rapport International, who always gives us a tidbit. Rapport International connects you to anyone around the world through language and culture. And, of course, today's is going to go along with law Did you know that several countries around the world have laws or rules when it comes to picking baby names? For example, in Denmark, under the law on personal names, if soon-to-be parents do not want to pick one of the already approved baby names on the list, they have to seek approval from the government. These laws are in place to protect babies from names that can be construed as embarrassing, outlandish, or likely to result in future ridicule. That cracks me up. David, what do you think about that? That's pretty restrictive. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I think there's social norms would probably take care of a lot of that itself, but. Right, right. Then then they'd pick up a nickname. So I jumped in and brought Dave into the conversation. Dave Rocchio of Lando and Anastasi is an intellectual property attorney whose practice focuses on strategic counseling on IP related issues involving technologies. He takes a holistic view of a business and its goals when developing an IP strategy. And he does have extensive experience in working with startups, both startups that are coming into the United States or US ones going outside of the United States. And that's actually how we've met through Softland Partners to help make international connections. So Dave, welcome to the Thanks, Global Marketing Wendy. Show. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I've heard of holistic used in a lot of way, but never around IP, intellectual mm-hmm. property. So can you tell me more about how you come at what you do with a holistic approach. Yeah, of course. No, thanks. That's a it's a great point. And I, you know, you do hear that hot that hot button word used a lot more and more these days. So I remember writing that somewhat hesitant to use it, but I think it's appropriate because, you know, when we as IP professionals and majority of my work is on the patent side. So I'm helping tech companies protect their inventions, file for patent protection to make sure somebody can't just do what they have invented. When we're looking at that, there are a lot of considerations, right? I know how many applications to file, where to file your applications, how aggressive to be in asserting your patents. There's all sorts of different areas to look at. And oftentimes it can be quite overwhelming. And especially for startups, they oftentimes don't know where to put their resources, right? Where to spend their money, their time, what countries or regions they should be thinking about. And so I find... When I meet, when I talk about holistic, I'm really talking about taking an overarching look at, okay, what is your current stage? What is your current position? What are you looking to achieve? Do we need to go for the home run right away? Or should we really look at what is going to be the most beneficial actions for you at this time based on your available resources? And we can plan down the road for things, but we really need to kind of look at it all. Are you looking for investment now? Are you looking to sell? Are you looking for long-term growth, short-term growth? So that's really what I mean is kind of taking a, a a big look at the company, the players, the competitors, the customers, and really taking actions that make sense. It may be a traditional approach and you kind of follow the general way that some people act with, with respect to patents, but oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's a unique approach based on specific circumstances. So I think that can be a big trap for especially startups where they start sinking lots and lots of money and time in places that they really don't need to be doing at this moment. Next thing that they find out their IP budget is completely gone and they really haven't gotten anywhere. An example of a, a startup that you worked with in a holistic approach 
and, and thought that it went really well. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the best example I can think of that we worked with was a startup out of Massachusetts who, you know, we we'll start at the end. They've, they've since got, since we started working with them, they've gone public. They're multinational now. They're very successful. But how we started was looking at their resources and looking at where they currently were, took a very strategic and targeted approach to their patent filing. So meaning we weren't just trying to um, capture everything under their sun with their application. We weren't trying to capture what they're doing and maybe what others potentially might do in the future. Okay. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about what they do? Are they a tech company? Yeah. Tech company. Um, okay. So they're in the United States when you start working with them, correct. like only in the U S Yep. okay. And so you had said you take an overarching look at the stage, what they want to achieve and what their goals are. Yep. So what stage were they in and what did they want to achieve? Yeah, early stage have some some resources available. You talking uh, one, ten, hundred million? What's early stage for somebody thinking about this? Sure. Yeah, they're more in the. I probably don't want to get into too much specific, but we're not. You're not. We're not just talking seed. You know, we're talking kind of the next couple, next round or two. So they have some. They have resources that are being spent and available for for. I would say not aggressive but also not really overly minimal. They had, we could come up with a plan and we could implement the plan without being going over the top. I'm just trying to get a scale. So what kind, when you're saying a startup and you don't, you could just give me a general range as to what kind of revenue or what kind of investment, because I want listeners to be thinking about whether they're the right size to think about this. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So I can give you the scale. I, I don't think I was. A, um, I know what their revenue was as a company at that time. I do now. I really was looking more at okay, based on their goals of be, expanding and across the U.S. and expanding to other countries, and then looking at their what was available as an IP budget. And so, I knew based on their IP budget what our filings were going to be. I know what a, a filing generally costs, right? So, as a general rule, so or a general example, I should say, an application, a, r- a rough place to land probably costs about $10,000, right? To, for that application to be prepared and filed. That's very rough. And some things come less, th- some things come more, obviously, depending on the, the complicated or less complicated nature of the technology. But in general, it's a good way to look at it. And basically- That's fantastic, yeah. Yeah. And so the initial, the initial filings, then based on that and knowing where they wanted to go, was limited to, we'll say, less than 10, Okay. So knowing that, knowing per budget, that kind of gives you a range for what their IP budget was. Now, based on the amount of technology and things they had going on, if resources were taken out of the equation, it could have been very aggressive. And, and especially in a space that is very dense right now in terms of other potential competitors and new developments, especially in the New England region where they were, where they are, they could have tried to capture a lot more of what their competitors were doing. So when you file, it probably helps to back back up a second. So when you file a patent application, you know, you kind of describe what you've done, what others have done. You lay out a nice story about why this new technology is valuable and why it's an improvement over what was done previously. At the end of the patent, they have the what they call the claims. The claims define the like legally, if it's granted, what you are allowed to stop others from doing. I think that's an important distinction. Another big mistake that people always make a patent does not give you the right to do anything. It does not guarantee success. It's not a it's not a guarantee that all of a sudden you're going to start making money if you have a patent. All it does is it lets you stop others from doing what it, your what is listed in the claim section of your patent. So when we were t- when we talk to startups in general and specifically the one we're talking about, I mean you can try draft those claims as broad as possible to include what the company is doing. Also thinking ahead, okay, well. Somebody might do it slightly differently. So we might really broaden this claim out to capture what other competitors might be doing. And that's certainly a strategy. And with unlimited resources, that might be a way to go. You just gave me so much information, (laughs) (laughs) which is fascinating because I hadn't thought about it that way. But I want to go back to the numbers since we started with that. So this company is, it's 10,000 per market. So you're talking per country. And they had a budget for 10 markets. So it, let me be more specific. So at, at that time, in the early stage time, it was only one market, it's the U.S., and there were less than 10 applications in the U.S. 
Oh, it was 10 in the US. So it's yes. 100 grand for just what they wanted to file in the US. It wasn't Correct. even going internationally. Right. And so admittedly, that's why we were talking about like what position they're in is important because they had funding. They were in a position to do that and file those applications, right? From there, what traditionally happens and what has to happen is you have basically a year to figure out what other countries you want to be in. Basically, there are a lot of international laws and agreements that require if you're going to claim that you had the right to your invention as of your first filing. So say we filed in this you know, this case, you file in the U.S. first, right? Through international treaties and laws, you can file in other countries within a year and you say, well, we're filing now in England, but we get the date as of our U.S. filing because we filed within a year of that U.S. filing. So you can see how quickly it goes from your U.S. cases, then within a year, it explodes out in ha and you have to file within that year. And so you can see, I mean, you got your 10 cases in the U.S. If you want to file each one of those in a different country, right, you can see how the cost exponentially increases. You're talking like another 100000 to do it in England. Right. And that's just one country. Now, if you want to do it in Canada, you want to do it in China, you want to do it in India, it goes up quickly. And the 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 issue becomes every one of those countries has different deadlines, different fees. Some are much more expensive than others. You can see where it just gets, it gets prohibitively expensive. So if you were going to file everywhere, everywhere, all at once or within a year, I mean, it'd be increasingly expensive. So when I'm saying take a holistic approach, that is kind of what I mean in that you have to be more selective. You Most startups don't have the resources to be spending money like that or don't have the resources to be filing everywhere. You have to be selective. And also thinking about what that application look like looks like. So I was saying you could try to capture everything that your competitors might be doing, but is that to have an application that is more difficult to get through the patent office and you're going to fight with the patent office about it for extended periods of time and spend lots more money on it, is that really beneficial to a startup who is looking for investment and looking for somebody to, to jump on board and give them money and show it's it's a viable company or viable technology? Probably not. So sometimes when we're looking at those goals and the current state of the company, we instead say, well, let's take a more targeted approach. Maybe we don't need to capture everything. We can focus and we can say, well, this is the actual commercial use that we're going to be using. These are what our customers are using. These are actually what is going to be valuable to us right now. And so maybe we focus instead right on that. There's always opportunities and procedures you can use to kind of, once you get those initial patents through, you can try to file additional applications that still claim priority back to your original date and you can expand it out. But those are all things that should be looked at. And when I'm saying holistic, that's what I'm talking about. It's not just taking a one size fits all approach where you say, yeah, let's file everywhere. Oh, broad is good. We can cover what competitors do. Well, that's true, but there's other things to consider. Right, right. That's a huge amount to consider, particularly if you're a startup on you're on the the budget, but if you want to protect in the international world, where do people normally, if there is a normal file first? Sure. After the US, if they're coming I'm gonna from say, the US. Okay. So yeah. Or I should say after your domestic market, is there some sort exactly. of trend of so, where people go? Right. So the first step, right, as you just mentioned, domestic, most countries have laws that require things that are invented in their countries to be filed in the country first without, you can, you can go around that if you get a permission. So for example, if you have an, a U.S. based invention that you want to file in India first, right, you can, you can ask for permission to do that. You can say, well, we're want to file an application for this outside the U.S. Here's a description of what we're doing. Can we do that? Usually the answer is yes. The only problem, the only issue that will come up is if it's national security related, usually that, that relates to things like nuclear and armaments and that sort of stuff. They don't want that stuff getting out before it's filed in the US first, or at least having a chance to prevent it from leaving first. So once that's done, wherever your home country is, then it, it could become somewhat difficult question. People ask all the time, like, well, where should we file? Well, it really is a specific question to each client, right? So the first is really a, a kind of a three-level priority we talk about. So first, you should definitely file where you are operating right? Because you want to be able to protect yourself and at the very least, give yourself tools and ammunition and leverage to, is, to operate wherever you're operating. If somebody challenges you, you can try to confront that with your own rights and your own arsenal of, of patents. Um, mm -hmm. 
Secondarily, you, want, you usually want to be where your customers are, right? To help protect them if needed, or if they're using your technology, using your systems, your services, whatever it is, whatever they buy from you, if they're using them in their home region, you want to have some potential there to step in and maybe protect it in that place too. So you can have leverage again in foreign places or different regions where your customers are operating. And finally, mm-hmm. the the kind of the final one be, is where your competitors are, right? To give you ammunition, if your competitors are saying, trying to assert infringement against you in one place, maybe then you can, you can use leverage that you have against them in their territories and their regions where they are operating. So it's kind of a three level huh. tier. In each one, I would say you start with one. If you have the money, you can go to two. If you have more money, you can go to three. Because at the very least, you want to protect what you're doing. And then it kind of goes from there. So it's kind of a chicken or an egg because, yeah. of course, you file on your own. And then you go, where are your customers? But you also have to think, where do I want customers from? Oh, it's this old marketing versus legal. Where oh, do I absolutely. put the money yeah. and what do I need to do first? And that's the, it, it's unfortunately, sometimes people don't figure that out until it's like too late, right? And how the system is set up requires you to make those decisions ahead of time in terms of like I was talking about the year filing deadlines and whatnot. So you don't have years to figure it out. You don't have, right. I mean, there's ways you can kind of kick the can down the road a little bit, but in yeah. all intents and purposes, you, you're not waiting, you know, five years after you're filing in your home jurisdiction to figure it out. You got a year to figure it out really. And you're doing guessing. You're guessing where the value might be. But on this, on, on that front, it always helps then to be continuing to research, continuing to develop technology. Because maybe you filed it in your in your home jurisdiction for your core technology. You chose countries A and B to expand to. That's it. Turns out C is really important. Over the next five to 10 years, you realize, well, geez, we need to really be in C, but we can't protect that core. But maybe over that time, you've been doing a lot of R&D and you've developed different twists to whatever you were doing or new additions. And maybe that has become really important and it wasn't covered in your original application, but maybe now you can file to that new stuff in C. And so you kind of come up in a different place. Yeah. Let me jump to a a different question because I'm interested in in the international because it's global marketing. Yeah. So say the last few international patents that you filed, what countries were they in? So, I mean, our most common places are, so Europe is interesting because Europe has an overarching European patent office that it's not directly tied to the EU. Actually, like the UK is not part of the EU, but it is part of the European patent system. So you file basically one application in in the European Patent Office, and it kind of proceeds through. And once, once you get a granted European patent, you then choose which countries you want it to be enforceable in. And, and even that's developed, progressing a little bit now because... I mean, this could be a whole other topic. They're, they just, they're rolling out now what's a unitary patent, which is basically one European patent that's going to be enforceable across Europe. But anyway, to your question, so Europe is number is probably number one. That makes sense because you get yeah. a lot of countries. Right. And then you got, once. and you can kick the, again, you, you, you can file a European patent and then you don't get a patent maybe till a couple of years later. And then you, then you choose, you say, oh, I want it to be good in Germany, UK, France. Yeah. Right. So you can kind of figure that out. Other big ones are China. Um, mm-hmm. And those are the two big ones. The next one, kind of, India is pretty popular. Australia, Canada, but not as much as you think. And, and this is more, this is, so my background is electrical engineering. So I'm dealing with like electrical based systems, software based systems. It's probably different for other technology areas. Like I know the life sciences is much more active in the, in the foreign filing realm. They file in a lot more places, but I think those are the big ones. The, the one place that's also big is what's called a, a PCT or a, it, it's a patent cooperation treaty. And it's another term for it is international application. So in reality, there's no way to get an international patent that's good in a lot of, in more than one country. You have to, even with Europe, you eventually have to choose specific countries, right? But there is, through all these treaties and the agreements between countries, there is a way to file one application that at least acts as a placeholder in 
a lot of different countries. Basically, any country that you'd ever want to file an actual patent in, they're, they're, they're a signatory to the Patent Cooperation Treaty. So you file this one international application, and that gives you rights. You kind of you it kind of gets examined. You get a report on it. What, what an examiner thinks about it. It'll never actually turn into a patent. But what it does is lets you choose later. So you file that. You get thirty months. Thirty months after that, you can choose. Well, I know I want to be in the U.S. I want to be in in Europe, and I want to be in China. And from there, you then proceed with those three separate cases forward. So that's probably the most one of the most common international ways for us to file because it kicks the can down the road. It allows somebody to make those specific country decisions maybe after two years when they really have a better handle on their resources, their customers, their competitors. It just allows for more flexibility. All right. I have to ask, what about language for filing patents? So it's, it's a good question and it can often be a problem because for, you know, every country, region, wherever you can, every patent office, right, has their own requirements in terms of language. So if you are filing direct in those countries, oftentimes it needs to be in the language of that office, right? So if you're filing direct in China, it needs to be mm -hmm. in Chinese. If you're filing in the US, it has to be in English. If you're filing in France, it has to be in French. Now, there, there are certain timelines. Some some places can vary, like maybe you can file in in English to start and they'll give you some time to get it translated kind of thing. But it's it's certainly it's it's a especially with tight deadlines. It's something that we need to be thinking about as filers in different countries often because if you're coming up on that one year deadline and you're a couple of days out and now you decide you want to file in China, well, getting that translation done on a hundred page document in a day because you have to send it out so they have it in their time and file it in their time, well, that can be problematic. So it's cer it's certainly in the front of our mind in terms of filings. And in addition, I mean, you can imagine having a bad translation or having an inaccurate translation can be quite troublesome when trying to deal with, you file your application, right? An examiner looks at it and says, well, you say here that A plus B plus C equals D. We all we say, no, that's that's a bad translation. What we meant, what, right? What we meant was this. And they say, well, that's not what you said though, Right. So it's always a concern to make sure we have accurate translations and and are accurately describing our invention because one little word flip, one little description of a kind of a, an example can really sink you. Yeah. Yeah, it's real interesting when we've done translation at Rapport International for patents, you a patent is inherently something new. And so translating the name or the process uh -huh. of it we, we frequently have to go back and ask, do you want it kept in English or the native language? Do you want us to come up with a translation that you can then test? Or do you want to put some other descriptor in there right. with translation? So that's part of the holistic strategic consideration that has to go into it. Yeah, it's it can be hard because by nature, when you're writing an application, you are allowed to define words, right? Or even come up with new words, really, as long as you define it and say, well, we, we use this word, yeah. we mean this. But that new, I mean, that doesn't have to be a real word. <laughs> I mean, it could be something you just come up with as a term to describe something. And then how right. do you translate that into a not real word into a different language, right? Right. It can be hard. So I heard the European Patent Office a while back started accepting machine translation. Did I hear right? And how is that handled with accuracy? That's interesting. So they, for certain things, they'll accept machine translations. And it's hard. I mean, we, we so we, on the US side, we see machine, machine translations a lot because uh, in, the, in the US Patent and Trademark Office, there, there's a duty, a responsibility that, is an affirmative duty that where anytime we get information that may be material to patentability, we have to tell the patent office about it. So if you have a, your U.S. case pending in a, a Chinese case pending, for example, and the Chinese case gets a, a response first and the, the Chinese examiner says, well, I'm going to reject you over these refer these Chinese references. We have to take those and submit them to the U.S. patent office and say, well, in this other case, we got these. These might be relevant. During that time, we have to provide either a machine translation of them, an English language 
abstract of what that document shows or a description of what is in the document and like why is it relevant. That oftentimes we're getting those documents. I can't read them. I don't know what's in them. So we're relying heavily on machine translations. Oftentimes like the EPO to your question is really good at having tools on their, their, their website, their portal, where you can automatically do translations. So you can at least kind of get a rough idea based on the, the drawings that you're looking at and you kind of piece it together to figure it out. But that, that's about my comfort level for using those translations. I mean, just to kind of give so me So you idea. get something in, you don't know what it is, you run it through machine translation to get the gist of it. But if it's something scary or dangerous or you have a liability, then you'd slow the process down and get it translated? Or how do you... Uh, yeah, I would say if it's... that level? No, it's a good question. I mean, you're right. I think it gives you a general gist. I think the, the if we had a real concern to like, what does this actually say? You know, we've had some attorneys in-house before that were, were native Chinese. So they'd helped us look at it before. I would, if it was a real, we're, this looks like, like really close. We're not sure there's any difference. We definitely would like get somebody to actually translate it, actually look at it. The problem comes if, you know, oftentimes there's dot deadlines and timelines set to when, when we need to submit these things. So mm -hmm. does that, us getting a real translation, does that align with the deadlines that are set or do we just need to use the, the, the machine one? Cause that's what we have and we have a short deadline and we need to go with it. So it, it's a, it is a problem that needs to be considered and thought about because those, I mean, it, it's not infrequent that we get, you know, there, there are translation issues and the examiner is relying on something in the machine translation and you read it and you go, this makes no sense. Look at the picture in this text. It doesn't, they don't align. It doesn't make any sense, but they're, but once it's in front of the examiner, it's very hard for, them, for you to say, well, that's not really what that means, you know? Wow. Okay. So it's this always this trade-off of I can get it quick and gist, but it might be wrong and cause a problem down the road. Like you could get your patent application rejected. Yeah, you could basically, yeah, yeah they could, right. You could submit your, that references from China with a machine translation then they come back and reject you and say, well, here in the the reference you cited, here's the machine translation that says this, right? And, yeah. and, and hopefully the examiner is open to discussing that and then you can talk about it, but it's always, yeah. it is a risk. Yeah, it ends up adding more time, more cost right. exactly. and more liability into it. Yeah, okay. And so the, the European Patent Office will accept certain types of material I think that have been they, machine translated? That's a good question. I'm not in terms of, so, because we don't file directly in Europe ourselves. We work with foreign counsel does the European filing. And we typically, so for the EPO, you can file in English. So we typically file in English. So we don't often deal with tran su supplying translations to the European Patent Office. We do get translations from them for through there, they have a really robust, I would say, especially compared to the US portal where you're allowed, you can pull up applications and patents from all around the world and click, click a button and it'll, it'll machine translate it for you. So we use that quite a bit. When you're doing your patent research and you have to yeah. see if there's something yep. that applies. Yeah, that makes sense because you get a, the gist of it. And then if you need more right. detail, then you pull it in. Yeah. And a lot of times with this stuff, you can kind of figure it out. I mean, especially like if we're talking about electrical systems in the cert, like the heart, the circuitry, I mean, the, how those things are drawn are the same and no matter what country you're in, right? The, the symbol right. for this component, the symbol for that, the text according, responding to it is different, but you can kind of figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting, but it doesn't matter where it is, but there's this, this separation out of when I need to get a gist translation when I can use pictures and diagrams mm -hmm. and, and to communicate in HR and when do I need, when's that liability or risk to my revenue that I need to get the high end translation. Yeah. And so you're seeing that. Yeah. What's the biggest mistake you've seen a company do with filing? And it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of double-ended, right? One of the biggest ones is not acting in time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and, you see this quite often. Like I, I attend numerous different conferences and was talking to new tech companies and startups and 
Some of them are foreign companies looking to come into the US and they're very excited, right? They're gung ho. They've been having great success in their home country selling this product or service for X number of years. And then they I they start I start talking to them. They're very excited. And I say, well, how long have you been doing it? They're like, oh, we've been selling this with great success for five years. And then I mean, it's very hard to tell them, but the and you've had you should see you should see some of the faces that I get response sometimes. As we talked about, there are year deadlines in all these countries. So you you start selling that product, you must file within a year, and it's it's a hard line. I mean, there's not a, a much wiggle room, and that's that's in the U.S. I mean, other countries are more difficult. Europe, for example, is a hard, absolute novelty bar. I mean, as soon as that thing is public, you're not allowed to file for it anymore. So you have to make sure that you're thinking about these things as a company early on in the process, before you start selling, before you publicly disclose, before you kind of go outside your confidence bubble of protected by NDAs or confidentiality agreements or whatever. You need to make sure things are ready and you you at least have a path forward, right? Where you've done, maybe you've done your first filing and you know, okay, we've did our filing. Now we can start talking to people. We can, we can have further filings within a year, but at least you know the process is happening because too often than not, these companies don't know that and think they can just wait to wait to file in the US, for example, later. And it's just not true. So all right. Is- so if you're a marketer and you have a new product and you're thinking about how to go global and you haven't patented it, <laughs> yeah. I mean the biggest learning from today, get out and patent it before you start selling it. Yeah. Fi- and it doesn't have to be granted. It can just be an application. So make sure you file first before you disclose anything outside of your company. Cause it, okay, because that that protects you as long as you file the application. For what's in the application, yes. So For what's in the, yeah. 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 All right, well, this has been absolutely fascinating because I've known you for years now and we've never deep dived into it this. But <laughs> yeah, but it's such a key part to, to global marketing is understanding how you're protected in different countries. Yeah, maybe another time we'll talk about the changes that have been in, in patent law so you can get protections in China. I know that used to be an issue before, but that's that's the next podcast. Version two, so, sequel. You know what I'm coming up with next. What is your favorite foreign word? So- I mean, ever since you flagged this for me to think about, I've been pondering it. And I always love hanging out with friends, love having a cold beverage or two. So I love anything that has to do with cheers, right? So you have the German Prost, you have Italian Salute, right? But I always go back to, I spent a semester in Hungary, in Budapest. And the words we really hooked on to was Hungarian for cheers, which is Egeshegera. So that's my favorite (laughs) word. That's great. Ega Sher- uh, say it again. Ega Shegara. Ega Shegara. Yeah. And look how, it's not how you sp- never look up how that. to spell it. It's not intuitive. <laughs> no, 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 no. I had to sound it out. Ega Shegara. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's a new one for me. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, where can people reach you if they're interested in talking to you about patents? Yeah. I- I'm always open to talking to anybody anytime. I'm in the office today. I'm in the office a couple of days a week. That number is 617-395-7078, but always available by email. It's just D Rocchio. So D-R-O-C-C-I-O at LALaw.com. Okay. L-A Law in Boston. In Boston, not LA. Yeah. <laughs> and your phone number again is 617-395-7078. You got it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dave, for joining us on the episode today. I uh, learned a ton and I know there's people that listen to the podcast in over 80 countries. So if somebody's coming to the U.S., now they know where to go. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy, for having me. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's a wrap for this session. A big thanks to you for listening to the Global Marketing Show. Hope you had just as much fun as I did. New sessions launch weekly on all places you find podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, and of course on our website. If you know someone interested in this topic, please tell them about us. Au revoir for now.